A very warm welcome to today's video. In this video, I'll be attempting to answer the question, why is the sky blue in color? Now I know that the topic might seem mundane as this is a very classic question. In high school, we are taught why the sky appears blue in color. The moment this question is asked, everyone has this fact memorized in their head. Shorter wavelengths scatter more than longer wavelengths and hence blue light scatters the most and hence the sky is blue in color, basically really scattering. Now I could just say this and end the video here, but have you ever wondered why? Why does shorter wavelength light scatter more than longer wavelength light? Most people memorize the fact that shorter wavelength light scatters more than longer wavelength light. But why? We should realize that science is not about memorizing facts, it's about building a mental model about how nature works. So in this video, I'm going to go a step further and explain rigorously as to why is the sky actually blue. It is going to be a journey for both of us, the one watching the video and me. And at the end of this journey, hopefully we'll have a better idea about the scattering of light which does not rely upon memorization of facts but logic. We are also going to learn as to how many different physics concepts come together to explain this one phenomenon. Let us begin. But before diving into the topic straight in, here are some topics that you should have an idea about as we are going to use these topics in the explanation of scattering of light. First, we must understand that light is an electromagnetic wave. Light consists of oscillating electric and magnetic fields which are perpendicular to each other and both are perpendicular to a propagation of light. Light is similar to waves on a string or ripples in a pond. Just like ripples in a pond are disturbances in water, light is a disturbance in the electromagnetic field. The electric field and magnetic field of light constantly vary as it propagates through a medium and follows a sinusoidal function. What this means is, just like how a sine wave changes its value from minus 1 to plus 1, the electric field vector in light also changes its value constantly similar to a sine wave and so does the magnetic field vector. Look at the diagram given. Here you can see that initially the electric field vector its magnitude is 0. Then it increases increases reaches a maximum and then decreases and then it inverts its direction and then increases in the opposite direction and then decreases and so on and so forth. You can see the same with the magnetic field vector. This is similar to a sine wave. In a sine wave, it first reaches a maximum of plus 1 and then decreases and then reaches a maximum of minus 1 and so on. So the electric field vector and magnetic field vector change their magnitudes similar to a sine wave. This also means that if a point charge is kept near light, since the electric field is constantly varying, the force experienced by the point charge will also keep constantly varying. Let us now talk about our Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere consists of predominantly nitrogen and oxygen molecules. These are diatomic molecules, meaning these molecules are composed of two atoms bonded together. Here, the red ones are the nitrogen molecules and the blue ones are the oxygen molecules. A nitrogen molecule consists of two nitrogen atoms which are bonded by a triple bond and an oxygen molecule consists of two oxygen atoms which are bonded by a double bond. Let us now look at potential energy curves. First of all, we'll look at potential energy as a function of distance of a system of two nitrogen atoms as one nitrogen atom approaches another nitrogen atom for bond formation. The potential energy curve for oxygen molecule or any other diatomic molecule will be similar to this. Here you can see the potential energy as a function of distance is on the y-axis and distance is on the x-axis represented by R and potential energy by U. These are the two atoms which are approaching each other. Notice that as they approach each other, the potential energy first decreases and reaches a minima. This is the point corresponding to a stable equilibrium. This is the point where the atoms make bonds with each other. But if the atoms come too close to each other, the potential energy increases, which means the force becomes repulsive in nature and hence the distance between the atoms increases. 
Let us now look at potential energy as a function of distance for a spring which is doing simple harmonic motion with a block attached to it. Again, potential energy is on the y-axis and distance is on the x-axis and this is the spring with a block attached to it which is doing SHM. As you can imagine, as the spring is doing SHM and as the block reaches the two extreme positions, the potential energy increases in both the extremes and the equilibrium position it is zero. Note that both the curves are very similar. Both the curves have a dip corresponding to the stable equilibrium point. Now we know that force is the negative of the derivative of potential energy with respect to distance. Since the potential energy curves of both the systems are very similar, what this means is the force is acting on a block attached to a spring and that acting on a nitrogen atom as it approaches another nitrogen atom are very similar. Thus, we can treat the bond that is formed between two nitrogen atoms in a nitrogen molecule as that of a spring. Similar is the story for an oxygen molecule or any other diatomic molecule. Light from the sun consists of predominantly UV radiation and little bit of light from the visible spectrum. We can visualize the two nitrogen atoms in a nitrogen molecule as two electron clouds connected by a spring. This is because the nucleus occupies 0.01% of the volume of the atom, the rest 99.99% is the electron cloud. Thus, we can ignore the nucleus in comparison to the electron cloud as the volume occupied by it is insignificant. Also remember that the electron cloud is negatively charged. When light from the sun passes through the nitrogen molecule, since light is an electromagnetic radiation, it applies an electric force on the electron clouds present in the nitrogen atom. For now, we will analyze the electron cloud of a single nitrogen atom. Since light consists of constantly varying electric field, a varying electric force will act on the electron cloud in the nitrogen atom. Suppose this is the light ray coming from the sun and this is our nitrogen molecule which consists of two electron clouds connected by a bond which will assume a spring as the forces are very similar. And this is the representation of the electromagnetic wave. When the light ray first hits the electron cloud of the nitrogen molecule, you can see from this diagram that at this point, the electric field vector is pointing in a downward direction and it is low in magnitude. But remember, the electron cloud is negatively charged. So it will feel a force in the upward direction. And as the wave passes through the electron cloud, eventually the electric field vector will be maximum and at that point, the electron cloud will feel a maximum force in the upward direction. But when it feels a force in the upward direction, since it is connected by a spring to the other electron cloud, the spring will apply a restoring force in the downward direction. Similarly, when the electron cloud feels a force in the downward direction, when the electric field vector inverts its position, then the spring will apply a restoring force in the upward direction. The restoring force is always applied opposite to the external force. Hence, we can say that the electron cloud will feel two forces in this process. The electrical force by the constantly varying electric field and the restoring force by the spring. And as the wave passes through this electron cloud, we can use We saw that when light hits the nitrogen molecule, it feels two forces in the process, the electric force and the restoring force. And as you can see, as the light wave passes through the entire nitrogen molecule, and as it passes through, then the nitrogen molecule will, will do this kind of motion. As the electric force will constantly keep changing its direction and so will the restoring force, the nitrogen molecule will oscillate back and forth. If you try to draw the FBD of the nitrogen molecule, it will look something like this. Here, the blue arrow denotes the electric force and the black arrow denotes the restoring force. These two arrows are actually vectors pointing in opposite directions. Note that the nitrogen molecule could also have been oriented like this or at any other random angle. In this case, the electric force will act in this direction and the restoring force will act in this direction. And if we attempt to draw the FBD of this nitrogen molecule, it will look something like this. 
here the blue arrow represents the electric force and the black arrow represents the restoring force we can further resolve the restoring force into its x and y components and analyze this motion as a combination of two 1d motions but the reason i am analyzing this motion is because this is much simpler than analyzing two 1d motions but if we analyze both the results of both should be exactly the same by newton's second law we know that the net force acting on an object with constant mass equals its mass times acceleration that is f net is equal to ma now the net force acting on the electron cloud that we are analyzing in the nitrogen molecule is the vector sum of the electric force that is applied by the varying electric field and the restoring force that is applied by the chemical bonds that is f net is equal to f electric plus f restoring now the electrical force is given by q e naught sin omega t where q is the charge of the electron cloud e naught is the amplitude of the electric field of the electromagnetic wave omega is the angular frequency of the electromagnetic wave t is time and the restoring force is given by m omega n square r since we can treat the chemical bonds as springs we can use the formula for restoring force for a spring to a chemical bond now m is the mass of the electron cloud omega n is the natural frequency of the spring that is the chemical bond and r is the distance through which the nitrogen atom is displaced from its mean position now f net is equal to ma here m is the mass of the electron cloud and a is the acceleration of the electron cloud so finally we have m now we know that acceleration is equal to d2x by dt2 so we can write m into d2x by dt2 is equal to minus q e epsilon naught sin omega t plus m omega n square r note that in this equation x and r are both the same as both represent the displacement of the nitrogen atom at any time t now this is a second order differential equation the above equation is the equation of motion of the electron cloud meaning this equation describes the motion of the electron cloud at any time t after solving this equation for r we get the following r is equal to a dash sin omega t plus phi and a dash is equal to e naught divided by m into omega square minus omega n square here r is the displacement of the nitrogen atom or the electron cloud at any time t omega is the angular frequency of the electron electromagnetic wave that hits the nitrogen atom in the first place t is time and phi is simply a constant here a dash is equal to e naught divided by m into omega square minus omega n square e naught is the amplitude of the electric field m is the mass of the electron cloud omega is the angular frequency of the electromagnetic wave and omega n is the natural frequency of the spring between the two electron clouds Notice that this equation gives us the displacement of the nitrogen atom at any time t. Also note that the equation of R is a simple harmonic equation. This means that the electron cloud under the influence of the electromagnetic wave does simple harmonic motion with angular frequency omega and amplitude a dash where a dash is equal to e naught divided by m into omega square minus omega n square. Also notice that the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion of the electron cloud depends on the angular frequency of the electromagnetic wave that hits it. So the maths is telling us that when an electromagnetic wave passes through a nitrogen molecule, the electron clouds in the nitrogen molecule will do SHM. That is their motion will look something like this. They will wiggle back and forth and back and forth since the displacement of the electron clouds at any time t is a simple harmonic equation. Now, by Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, we know that when a charged particle is accelerated, it emits energy in the form of electromagnetic radiations. In the above case, the electron cloud in the nitrogen atom is doing SHM under the influence of the electromagnetic wave. Clearly, the electron cloud is accelerating, thus it must emit electromagnetic radiation of its own. Since the electron cloud is doing SHM at frequency omega, it also emits electromagnetic radiation of frequency omega. 
that is the electron cloud emits light of the same frequency as that of the light which causes it to oscillate in the first place. For example, if red light is incident on the nitrogen molecule, the nitrogen atoms will emit red light of their own. When light is incident on the electron clouds, the electron clouds emit light of their own. This phenomenon is called scattering of light. Now we know that the amplitude is basically referring to the intensity or brightness of light. For example, when we increase the brightness of a torch light, we are basically increasing the amplitude of the light wave coming out of it. Notice the amplitude term in the SHM equation of the nitrogen atom. More the amplitude of oscillation of the nitrogen atom, more intense or bright will the radiation be. Notice that the amplitude term depends on the difference between the natural frequency of the nitrogen atom and the frequency of light. It is actually inversely proportional to it. The closer is the frequency of light to the natural frequency of the nitrogen atom, the smaller will the difference, the smaller will the denominator and the higher will be the amplitude. In other words, as the frequency of light gets closer to the natural frequency of the nitrogen atom, the intensity of radiation emitted by the nitrogen atom will increase. It turns out that the natural frequency of nitrogen and oxygen molecules are close to the frequency of ultraviolet light. That is, when ultraviolet light is incident on the nitrogen and oxygen molecules, they emit radiation of maximum intensity. But the thing is, the human eye cannot see ultraviolet light. Thus, in reality, the sky is actually ultraviolet in color, but we humans cannot see it. The color that is closest to UV radiation in the visible spectrum is violet. So after UV, violet light is the one which gets scattered the most. Then why isn't the sky violet in color? Well, there are two reasons for it. If we see the various frequencies of light emitted by the sun, we will observe that the sun emits very little amount of violet light. It majorly emits UV light and other frequencies in the visible spectrum other than violet. Thus, only a little amount of violet light is incident on the molecules and hence the intensity of violet light scattered is very low. The second reason being, the human eye is not sensitive to violet light. Our eye is more sensitive to colors such as red, green and blue. Now the next color that is closest to UV is blue, meaning the next color that will be scattered the most is blue. And that is why the sky is blue in color.